All right, so I'm finally back with the Cybersecurity Home Lab project. And in today's video, it's going to be over a SEM, or System Information Event Management System. I've done a video here talking about what a SEM does and how it works. And in today's video, I'm going to be working with Splunk. Splunk is a industry grade SEM and they offer a community edition. So what I'm gonna be doing today is setting up this SEM and using a universal forwarder to forward data from a Linux server over to the SEM so that I can visualize and understand what's going on with the different systems connected to the SEM. I really have no idea what I'm doing here, so it's gonna be a lot of research. Uh, so yeah, let me go ahead and give you an overview of what I have found so far. All right, so transitioning over to my computer here, I have a couple of things that I'm running right now. So I'm gonna be separating myself from the virtualization that I've done on my other cybersecurity home lab computer. And I'm actually gonna be using Linode here. And in front of me, I have a couple of machines already set up. And this includes my Splunk test environment, as well as a basic Linux server. So I'm gonna be using Linode to power this project. I'm gonna be working with this guide here to go ahead and just basically set up the Splunk dashboard. And from there, I can use the Splunk official documentation to understand what's going on with uh, the universal forward or to get data into the dashboard. Probably a lot more resources I'll be working with, but here is what I have so far. So let's go ahead and get started by setting up the Splunk dashboard. All right, a couple hours later, here I am in front of me, I have the Splunk dashboard up and running. So as you can see here, I went ahead and set up the Splunk dashboard on my base Ubuntu server Linode. And from that, I'm able to get into the Splunk Enterprise website by going through the IP address as well as the default port. I'll leave that link up in the description below. So now the next thing is to go ahead and get the data into the Splunk machine and understand what the heck is going on here. All right, so while setting up the Splunk for, I want to quickly mention the FlexiSpot desk, which has been sent to me by the FlexiSpot team. I already have a couple of FlexiSpot desks and they were actually generous enough to send over one for my home office. Specifically, I received the FlexiSpot Glass Black EG8B for my home office. And so as you know, I'm all about productivity with these standing desks. The FlexiSpot Glass Black is a perfect standing desk to meet my productivity needs. It comes with a motorized lifting system for ease of use. There are four different numbered modes you can use to set different height adjustments, whether you want to stand, sit, or it's something in between but it also comes with the standard up and down arrows to meet your height needs the glass finish looks great even comes with a little drawer supply for notepads and pencils the FlexiSpot glass black desk is a perfect desk to boost your productivity so if you're interested you can go ahead and use the link in the description below and thanks again for FlexiSpot team for sending one of these over Whew. okay so after getting lost for a long time i finally used that youtube video and i figured out something the Splunk architecture processing components. So here they are. In Splunk, we have three major components, forwarders, indexers, and search heads. Forwarders are used to forward or send data into the Splunk enterprise machine. This is gonna be the centralized device, which is going to store all of that information and populate that data so that it can be queried. After the data is forward, it's indexed, meaning it's stored. Indexers store the data so that it can be queried. Once the data is stored, you can go into the search heads. This is where you can actually look up the data, look for what is anomalous, whatever type of data that you're looking for, and you can use the search query language to set up and actively look for different types of data and populate dashboards from that. So now that we know the basic Splunk processing components, it's time to set up this universal forwarder. Okay, so to actively set up the universal forwarder, you can actually download the Splunk universal forwarder on the official webpage. I'm gonna be using a bare bones Linux server. So I'm gonna use the wgit command to go ahead and install this forwarder into my machine. All right, so it's a couple hours later, and I finally finished kind of my basic goal of getting data into Splunk so that I can go ahead and search for it. All right, so here in front of me, as you can see, I have my Linux machine, which is running Splunk right now, as well as another Linux machine running the Splunk forwarder, sending data, specifically the syslogs into my 
uh, Splunk dashboard here. So if we close out of here, we can go ahead and see the data coming in. Like I said before, we can go ahead and use the search to query for specific data matching a pattern or a string. So in this case, you can go ahead and use host, but you can go ahead and pipe things and you can add other information, such as using the table to go ahead and uh, query for specific data. So here in front of me, as you can see, I went ahead and created a table with the source type and date hour. And as you can see, it just pops up here. The query language in Splunk is very powerful. I didn't really touch a lot on it, but uh, definitely a lot to be learned in that front. Because I'm interested in the security side of Splunk, I went ahead and tested some uh, test use cases where you would actually look for indicators of compromise. So what I tried doing was a basic test. I wanted to see if I, let's say, logged into a Linux machine and had the root username and password as nothing or whatever information, would it be sent to the Splunk Sun? So that's what I went ahead and did with a new putty session. Uh, you can see that the logs are sent to the dashboard. You know, let's say you had 5,000 different login attempts in two minutes and you didn't have rate limiting or some sort of control on that Linux machine. That could be a tell that someone is trying to break into that Linux server, for instance. So I just wanted to see, you know, other types of indicators of compromise or other types of activities uh, that you could do on a Linux machine. Uh, so that was just a basic one that I just performed there. Another very powerful feature that I figured out here, of course I knew this before, but actually doing it, is you can go ahead and create new dashboards from the data that is sent to the send. So for instance, you could visualize this data so that you, know, you could show in a dashboard how many attempts you have per day on that Linux server with SSH. Very basic uh, stuff here. And what you can do is you can add new dashboards and you can create the different types of panel content. Now, I didn't create any dashboards because I didn't have a sufficient amount of data, but using a quick YouTube search, as you can tell, you can make some pretty powerful graphs, line graphs, bar graphs, all types of different dashboards to visualize your data. So that was it for what I did within this project. A very basic setup of setting up Splunk and getting a universal forwarder to send data into Splunk to search for that data. All right, so that is it for today's video. This actually wraps up the Server Security Home Lab project. Um, so today's video was pretty basic with setting up a SEM and getting data inside it. Hopefully you have enjoyed this series. Uh, and finally, it is time to wrap up. All right, so that is it for today's video. Until the next video, have a good day.